First on Film and Entertainment, the week that Mary Poppins officially opened. Now, we all grew up with Mary Poppins and we saw the 1964 film, which, if I'm not mistaken, won five Oscars, including one for the indomitable nanny, Julie Andrews. Now, it, it really was one of my favourite movies growing up as a kid. Jackie, you used to... Was it edit or write a column called Karina or Corinne or something for the Herald Sun? What was it? And did you, was that one of those things you spoke about? I beg your pardon? Coronella. Yes, Coronella. Coronella. Look, it's a long time. Uh, Alex, you're not from Melbourne if you didn't grow up with Coronella. No, I'm afraid I never read your column, not because I, now that I knew you, I would have, but I didn't. So, you know, I'm sorry. In fact, we were a household, that was in the Herald Sun, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Actually, yes, it was in the Sun News Pictorial. It actually started in 1923, uh, but I didn't start then. I started, I started <laughs> a little good. later. You, 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 well, I don't know. You look pretty good for somebody who's 100 and uh, whatever it is. Uh, th- we were a family that only subscribed to the age, <laughs> so that's my excuse. And there was no online purchasing of anything, and you know, way back in the day. So anyway. There, um, was, there was no comparable children's page in the age actually. There was one in the Argus, and I think the Argus and the and uh, and the Herald sort of um, ended up with, anyway, 1923 it was, and I was the 13th Coronella. Wow, okay, and, and but part of what you wrote, you wrote about kids' things. Oh, then- no, it wasn't just, a, it wasn't, just, a column was a very small part of it. It was ra- basically engaging with um, young um, uh, yeah, children in the family of uh Sun News Pictorial and Herald Sun readers oh. with going in competitions and prizes and quizzes and riddles and all those wonderful things that are just um, no longer really readily available to the kids. Um, and I always, what I loved most about it was we discovered this wonderful engagement um, between the generations as mums and dads would be off busy on a Saturday doing their shopping and other things. And the children would be, you know, minded with the, by grandparents and grandparents remembered doing it back in the 40s or whenever they were children. And there was a lovely connection across the generations with that oh, page. That's, that's, that's tremendous. I mean, it's really, it's really nice to hear. So, so movies were just part of it. In other words, kids' films, whenever they came out, you used to review them, yeah? Oh, well, I didn't review them on the page, but we always gave away tickets and sometimes we actually had private screenings with wonderful people like Marianne Colopy who would give us their um, private cinema to host a party for the winners of the competitions. Oh, it was wonderful. Well, I'm getting all I'm getting all no, no, it's, lovely. And it, it's terrific now, Alex. No, no, it's terrific to reminisce because I mean one of one of my favorite uh, you know, it's funny looking back at it now, but the corner shop. I mean we we all grew up with Dave we're, we're sort of dating ourselves, but I mean Peter and Greg, you'd remember the corner shop where kids used to go along and, you know, it, you only used to spend uh, sixpence or whatever it was and you could get quite a bag full of lollies and it was one of the highlights. I mean, that, we 7-Eleven doesn't, I mean, you know, I'm not having a go at 7-Eleven, but it doesn't quite uh, mean the same thing, does it, really, I suppose, when you're talking about children and, and growing up. I mean, are there corner shops outside schools these days or not? Anything like it? Uh, yeah, the country town that I spend a, a fair bit of time in they still have a corner shop but I had a corner shop as well I I grew up in Oakley in the 70s and 80s and oh did you moved, really yeah oh. and then moved to the country and yeah we had a corner shop even when I was in Oakley oh uh, and and Peter Krauss did, did you also frequent one of these or not oh yeah I, I did on occasion <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, less than enthusiastic by the sounds of it, Peter. Uh, what about you, Greg? I grew up in the country town, so the corner store didn't, didn't quite exist there. You had the local milk bar and that kind of thing. Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, the reason, obviously, we're talking about all this, we're, we're getting back to Mary Poppins. Jackie, was Mary Poppins part? Because I, I, I think every generation seems to love Mary Poppins. Was that anything that came up in Coronella? Uh, no recollection? No, not that I remember. There was... Okay. No, but not that I remember. The reason, the reason I sort of mention it is because I suppose games and the things that kids play has become far more sophisticated. It didn't take much for us as children to be engaged and entertained. These days it takes electronic devices in particular if you're going to uh, expose your children to it that early on. Uh, but 
this is the most wonderful, we'll talk about Mary Poppins later, but it's the most sophisticated Mary Poppins with the magic that was instituted. If any of you have seen Harry Potter, that really took magic to another level in stage shows and stagecraft. This has continued it and you just go, wow, it was just absolutely extraordinary. Having said all of that, what we're going to do is we are going to start on a brilliant movie, something that I've been really looking forward to talking about because we saw it uh, well before Christmas and there was an embargo on it and this week it opened and it's called The Whale and it's got me really excited, probably a film that's excited me more than any other since lockdown. It's M-rated, it's 117 minutes and Amongst the things about it that got me excited is the performance by Brendan Fraser. I sincerely hope he wins the Oscar. Uh, I mean, he's, boy, has he come back. And there, there was been, there've been a number of articles about him in the papers uh, about what he's you know gone through and so on, which sort of gives gives you a lot of insight. And I'm just delighted to see him in a role that you would never have expected him to to fill. And you, there's been a number of other actors. I mean, just before we talk about The Whale, Peter and Greg in particular, and Dave, can you think of other actors that have transposed or disappeared from the, the limelight and then suddenly come back with a vengeance? John Travolta, for example, comes to my mind. Uh, uh, Ethan Hawke, um, Colin Farrell, um, Keanu Reeves. They all went and did their time in B-grade movies before they came back to the big screen again. What Bruce, happened, Willis, Bruce Willis a little bit to some extent too. Yeah, well, well whatever happened, I'm just trying to think, whatever happened to Colin Farrell when you say he, he disappeared, I, it sort of goes back and I can't remember exactly what happened there. Because so I mean, he, made, he made a couple of big bombs where the films just didn't do well at the box office and um, suddenly he wasn't finding himself doing Hollywood blockbusters anymore, but he went back and did movies like Seven Psychopaths and that kind of put him back on track he was doing more artistic kind of films but yeah he had a a bit of a b-grade um straight to dvd time there after i'm trying to think there was a big big blockbuster that he did and it just bombed and he couldn't get a role after that okay and, and bruce willis kind of recall would it yeah that's it yep and, and bruce willis uh, in terms of because he, he he was massive absolutely huge huge star when was his downtime greg when he went through that stuff with a um, few B-grade movies and then sort of things like Look Who's Talking. Uh, and then, yeah. he's come back, then he's come back with through Pulp Fiction. That's that's yeah. true too. I, I mean, it, it's funny. If I was thinking about an actor, though, John Travolta is the one that really still stands up in my – or stands in my mind as being a, a really good example. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. as well, maybe? Was, yeah, definitely. He was, he was untouchable after his um, – his drug and alcohol problems there for a while, but that was um, Ali McBeal, the TV show, kind of put him back on That's the map. Right. So yeah, I mean it's great, you know, second chances, all of that sort of stuff. And so, what about uh, Mickey Rourke? And if we're talking about uh, Darren yeah. Aronofsky's film uh, The Whale, of course yep. he also directed The Wrestler. Yep, he did. Yes, there we go. It's 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 great. Uh, what about any? We've we've mentioned a, a surfeit of males. Any females that we can think of? None immediately comes to my mind, but I'm sure you guys can help out. Jackie, any thoughts there in terms of people that have, have sort of um, done good, then suddenly disappeared from the screen and then re-emerged? We might, anyway, if we well, go ahead. Going but. back in the past, C Catherine Hepburn is a good example where she was seen as a uh, box office poison for a while and eventually was able to come back into cinema. Yeah, yeah, valid. Okay. In, in more recent times, I don't... Angelina Jolie, we haven't seen. Michelle Sorry. Rodriguez. Really? When, when did, I mean, well, she, but she, she did all jail. of these. Pardon me? She went to jail. Oh, did she? I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, there, there, there's certainly, that. that is a comeback story. Angelina Jolie, we haven't seen a lot of. Um, she, You know, she hasn't really gone through a quiet time, but she's sort of uh, backed off a little bit, hasn't she? Uh, obviously, she's been going through a number of personal issues, uh, including separation. But still, it's, uh, it'd be interesting to see, because uh, she was probably the biggest star on the screen for quite some years. Anyway. Well, sometimes, Alex, it's hard to tell when people uh, vanish because they go off and do, um, you know, like series for, for um, some of the online streaming services and things like that. And, and unless you subscribe to that, you wouldn't know where they've gone or what they're doing. You think they've just vanished. 
That's a really good point. And this changes the dynamic because these days, you know, you're getting you're, you're getting just as much money by doing that sort of stuff and streaming is becoming bigger and bigger. So valid. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there was another comment from somebody there. No? Okay. The Let's go back to the whale. So char, this is all set in a small rundown first floor apartment in Idaho. This is the whale. Charlie is morbidly obese and his blood pressure really is off the charts. He's suffering from congestive heart failure. So he can he can barely move. He, he gets by with the aid of a, a Zimmer frame. He's middle aged. He lives alone in an apartment that he never leaves, and he gorges himself. He orders his food in, and that means lots of carbs and sugar, including daily pizzas. He is an online university English teacher who encourages his students to be bold and express their honest feelings in writing. Do you do that, Greg? What? Encourage you, <laughs> encourage your students to be bold and express their honest feelings in writing. Uh, You're an well, English teacher. I, I'm not a teacher. I'm a tutor. So slightly different. I work with them to make sure, keep them on track. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but but is keeping them on track, does that mean that they be conservative or they be bold? What do you reckon? Uh, most of them tend to be a bit conservative. Okay. Well, one day out of the blue, oh, you get a couple of them to be a bit bolder, but but mainly they're conservative. Mm. In fact, it, we should uh, sidebar here. Your students did particularly well last year as well, and they they thanked you for your efforts. So obviously, it's something that must give you a great deal of satisfaction, Greg. Oh, it's nice to be appreciated. Yes, yeah, and to know that your efforts have, weren't in vain. But I mean, I I honestly think that if you get the right teacher in any environment. It can make a huge difference to your standing and, and the way that, you know, you if you a teacher, especially at a young age, you're so malleable and you can get somebody who can be an absolute so-and-so and really set you back on your heels and then somebody who encourages you and it can, you know, set up the rest of your life. So, yeah, teaching profession is undervalued at times. One day, out of the blue, Charlie is visited by a young Christian missionary called Thomas, played by Ty Simpkins. He arrives just as Charlie's having a severe medical episode, but refuses. He simply refuses Charlie to go to hospital. He claims it's because he has no health insurance, but he relies instead upon daily visits from a friend of his who's a nurse, Liz, played by Hong Sho. She and Charlie both recognise that the end is near for him, notwithstanding her frustration at what, well, is really his intransigence in seeking appropriate medical attention whenever these episodes happen, she does what she can to help him. And Liz is also frustrated by the arrival of, of the Bible basher. During the course of the movie, we find out why. Importantly, we also discover Charlie used to be married to Mary, role called by Samantha Morton, but he left her and their then eight-year-old daughter Ellie nine years ago after he started a love affair with a male student. So it turns out that he's gay. He has not seen his daughter since. Unexpectedly, the now wild and angry child, played by Sadie Sink as a 17-year-old, he enters his life. And that happens after Charlie promises to help her write essays in an endeavour to get her through school, which she is failing. So, look, that's that. Even though it seems like a long descriptor, it, it's barely brushed the surface of what's going down here. But I don't want to go further because I don't want to spoil the surprise. Nor the reward I reckon one gets by watching this very, very special movie. It, it, it really has the appearance of a totally involving theatrical piece, and to me, that's not so surprising, given that it's been written by Samuel D. Hunter, based on his own acclaimed play 2012 play of the same name and uh, it's the uh, Darren Aronofsky who did the Black Swan he is at the helm in which gradual reveals help build the full picture did you enjoy the whale Jackie oh enjoy is so far from being the right word Alex I found I mean I think it's quite a depressing film it is a depressing film the story's depressing the way it's the the way it's set this cost claustrophobic messy and we are told that it's smelly apartment with uh, um old food dropped all over the place um 
I, I did feel the sense of it being a play right from the start, partly because it's in such an, a, a small a small environment. And, and the more it went with the discussion back and forth and the characters who come in and leave and each has a, has a you know, a conversation, um, I, I, I kept thinking it felt a bit like a Tennessee Williams play where they kind of probe each other's weaknesses and they rake over the past and all their insecurities and a few self-absorbed monologues and this kind of thing. So the sense of a play very much about it. I don't mind that. I love to see, I've seen, you know, quite a few films that have come out beautifully from plays, but I found this um, downbeat and almost with an inevitable ending. Um, Does that worry you? And since I said the word ending, I'll say I hated the ending right up. Okay, but but sorry, the fact that it's depressing, does that, that troubles you as such? Well, you asked if I enjoyed the film. Yeah, but okay. So, as a movie, then I did indeed ask you that. But uh, I mean, I, I suppose in well, maybe the wrong word. Maybe I said uh, maybe I should have asked. Did you appreciate the movie for what it was? Because I mean, to me, I, I, I I'm just the sort of person who often likes something that is not necessarily uplifting, but is a, a, a brilliant piece of work, which I saw. Well, you, I, I, I totally get it. And I think there's a difference between your emotional reaction as a member of the audience watching the film and whether you're looking at the crafting of this as, you know, in its in its production and presentation and dialogue and all those things. And uh, it's I was almost unable to kind of separate. I couldn't separate those two. I found it really troubling in fact I woke up at three o'clock this morning and it was churning round and round in my head I was trying to work out why it troubled me so much I Mm. I didn't enjoy it I found it difficult and I don't think I I I liked the way a lot of it was presented really and when you say you don't like the way a lot of it was presented can you tell me what you didn't like and talk to me about the Brendan Fraser performance Brendan Fraser, obvious, yes, uh, I mean, he did great. And I, I think that what um, uh, Aronofsky said about he hoped that people who saw the film would forget the, you know, the the makeup of the the of Brendan Fraser's appearance within a matter of minutes, and I certainly did. Um, I thought I thought it was magnificently um, presented as this morbidly obese um, man who, you know just everything about that was was true and honest um you know he kept seeking honesty but he wasn't honest with himself and you know the whole death wish thing and that yeah troubling to me to my mind yeah all right now what what about you peter uh did you appreciate do you think brendan fraser deserves an oscar I think it's it's an excellent performance, although the prosthetics did have a lot to, to say in his performance. But nevertheless, uh, it's very good. And it's interesting how this film uh, is sim- somewhat similar to Aronofsky's film The Wrestler, where the father-daughter uh, relationship tries to reconnect as part mm-hmm. of the story. Look, I, I think that there has been some criticism about the fat-shaming elements of this film and uh, of this uh, morbidly obese character and of uh, just going over the top uh, in many respects. So I I think I have some issues with uh, the story to some extent, especially the symbolic nature of the Christian missionary and the the nurse who is uh, played by Hong Chao who... uh, tries to connect with him and can't it's it's almost as if this um this film needed a little bit more rewriting uh from the stage play Sorry, and also to flesh out sure. maybe yeah. a little bit more of the the flashbacks and the fantasy element which comes into the film I, i'm i'm still not clear on that because I, I actually thought the characterizations were tremendous i i had absolutely no issues with any of it so what when what were your issues that they were exaggerated personas or what? Well, uh, certainly the Christian missionary was an exaggerated persona and, and uh, even though there is a revelation in there, it, it 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 doesn't quite fit in there because I'm just trying to think what the redemptive process is about having that character in there and, and uh, having the nurse there who is pretty much there just to uh, sympathise and not able to do anything. I thought... Yeah, that it's a device which uh, creates more of affection for the for the lead character. I, I I just felt that there were some elements to the film that didn't quite hang together for me. What about you, Greg? I haven't seen this one yet. 
Ah, okay, fair enough. Uh, open canvas for for when you do, Dave. Oh, look, this film blew me away. I I love the screenplay. I thought it was a a brilliant screenplay in that Aronofsky had twists and turns. And there, I know so many people who are going to see this film that that just are going to see it because of Brendan Fraser in a fat suit. So the fact that this film actually had a story that draws you in and makes you feel sorry for this character, but also has revelations all the way through. This is not a Mills and Boone film where, um, or a Hallmark film where you just have to feel sorry for this guy. There's revelations all the way through here, but that screenplay, not only does it cause a suspense for the audience, but it also brings about these brilliant performances. This is one of those films that's very rare in the sense that every single actor here seems to bring their A-game and they're lifted by the screenplay. So I thought this was an absolutely brilliant film. Um, it's right up there with um, with Banshees for me as the film I want to see do well at the Oscars. So, yeah, an amazing film. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I feel similarly. I, I, look, I, I think that y- you really do see Fraser in a different light and it is an Oscar-worthy turn, no question complete with breathlessness, physical impairment, desperation, stoicism. Uh, let's be honest, he's repugnant and also alluring as Charlie. And that is the sign of a brilliant actor, somebody who can pull that off. I, I thought Sadie Sink, if we talk specifics, she was mesmerising as this sort of vitriolic, estranged daughter, Dave, massive chip yep. on her shoulders. And, and that delivery, her delivery, nothing short of astounding. Each barb hits its mark with, to me, remarkable clarity and conviction. She's got talent in spades. I really long to see what she does next. Definitely. Yeah, that's one of the amazing things about this film. Quite often you'll go and see a film and there'll be one or two standout performances. This is one of those films where Brendan Fraser, um, Sadie Sink, Ty Simpkins, Hong Chow, they're all brilliant in their roles. Absolutely. Well, Hong Chow, recently she captivated audiences with that no holes barred performance in the menu. And and now here she be, be, backs it up again, doesn't she? Another look at me showing such a rounded and accomplished actor seems to have a fine understanding of the human condition. And and in this case, in equal measure, she's, well, she's got desperation, she's got anger, she's got love, understanding and acceptance to, to the persona that she has here. And I, I agree, Ty Simpkins, he readily, to me, channeled the dichotomy that's the hallmark of the, the Christian zealot with more than a skeleton or two in the closet, and that's that's his his part. So the intense character focus, uh, I reckon, part of part of the the beauty of this is Matthew Libertique's cinematography. Uh, it greatly be- benefits the production, the way he sort of uh, focuses in on the characters, and and it's almost like the lens itself become. It, it's a window to the world. Uh, it's a window to the souls of the characters. And that, that again, really stood out to me. I thought it was a f- film of rare quality, worked its way into my psyche as only the fine, finest of movies and offerings like this can. And I see it as must-see material. It deserves to be heavily fated in the, the upcoming Oscars. Uh, you know, whether it Alex, just... I have a question for you. Please. Have you, have you seen it a second time or will you see it a second time? I haven't uh, simply because I've been too busy. Would I? Absolutely. No question at, at, at all. And I reckon, look, I, I, t- I soaked it all in. I, I, I took it all in and thought, wow. And it is one of those movies that I would like to see a second time. I, you know, I, I'm not sure how. I think it, it, it deserves to win. Uh, from recollection, it's got uh, Hong, Hung Cho, Hong Chow has an Oscar nomination, does she not? As does Brendan Fraser. Both of them deserve to win, in my estimation. But I, I, I would put money on Brendan Fraser. I really would. I think he he really is extraordinary in this. So let's get some scores. Dave, you and I are going to be the high watermarks here. So let's let's uh, go. Let's start with uh, let's start with you, Jackie. Where where did you? Okay. Well, I well in talking of performances, I thought some of them were overblown and repetitive in the actions and things like that. But that. that that didn't get to me. I did like some of the lovely language in the tutoring he was giving uh, in the Zoom calls. So if you if you actually listened to what he was saying, I thought it was beautifully, beautifully put. Um, but in the end, I couldn't feel empathy with this character. And as I say, I found the film disturbing. It troubled me. I ended up giving it seven out of ten. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Peter. 
Yes, I agree with Jackie. I'm not as convinced by the uh, the writing of the film uh, as uh, some others are. And uh, uh, I mean, Brendan Fraser's performance, yes, top notch. Uh, he may win the Oscar. We'll see. Uh, I give the film seven out of ten. Mm. And again, it's just the way we've all spoken about it. Ex- exactly divided along those lines. Dave, you and I are going to get very high marks for this. Where did you see it? Yeah, look, I probably the only way I can describe how much I love this film was I went out and bought the screenplay. Um, they're not cheap to buy, so yeah, look, I'm giving it the magic ten. I really did love this film. I, I've been back and seen it again, and I'm hoping to see it again this weekend. So yeah, just an amazing film. There you go, Jackie. You've been told by both both Dave and I. See it again. Nine out of ten for mine. It's uh, leading the 2023 film of the year. Uh, and the cavalcade of stars on your your program, Gregory. So we'll see where it uh, ends up at the end of the year, but well worth a look. On Jair, 88 FM, what's love got to do with it? Well, a great deal, I reckon. Let's uh, let's have a look at this. Jemima Khan, former wife of the Pakistani cricket captain and politician Imran, has written a cross-cultural romantic comedy, 109 minutes, M-rated, and you've got Lily James in the role of Zoe. Award-winning documentary filmmaker, whose choices in men have been less than satisfactory, shall we say. She's best mates with an oncology registrar called Kazim, played by Shazad Latif, whose Pakistani family lives next door to her flamboyant divorced mother, Kath, Emma Thompson. So Zoe and Kazim even sneak off together to the treehouse in his backyard, where he enjoys a forbidden smoke. Although there is clearly a closeness between them, the good mates, save for his first kiss when they were both kids, when they kissed one another, romantically they have not connected. And then one day he announces to her that he'll enter an arranged marriage, although in modern parlance, I, I, I had not heard this term, it's an assisted marriage. Is that, by the way, is that a term you're familiar with, assisted marriage, any of you? Had you heard no. that? No. Okay. So maybe maybe it's just our, our age that we, we know them as arranged marriages. But anyway, while taken aback, Kazim cites to Zoe the divorce rate in Britain. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it was mentioned at 55%. And that was compared to the, uh, the divorce rate from arranged unions, which was 6%. So, wow. I mean, Zoe then is unsuccessfully pitching her latest documentary idea, to disinterested producers when she puts to them the concept of love contractually. I love that term. I thought it was wonderfully utilised in the movie. Suddenly, these producers are on board. And now the only obstacle that remains is convincing Kazim to be allowed to record his every move on his journey to wedded bliss. And so it is that Zoe films Kazim and members of his family, including his parents, brother, sister, grandmother, Zoe's there when Kazim and his parents meet with a cultural consultant called Mo the Matchmaker. Asim Chowdhury plays that particular role. And she records his first internet visual hookup with a young Lahore-based law student called May Muna, played by Sajal Ali. Very quickly, that initial meeting results in engagement, then a trip to Pakistan for what turns out to be a three-day wedding. But Try, though, as Kazim and May Muna do for the sake of the family, all is not right. So that is What's Love Got to Do With It? Very well written and performed. I was just trying to think, uh, you're, you're probably a good one to ask about this, Peter. You know how th- there are sort of like, it's almost like actualization where there are interviews, documentary style with the parents and the brother, sister and grandmother. We've seen that a, a number of times before. Uh, was Was when Harry met Sally, one of them, I'm just trying to think of, movies that have done that off the top anybody else can jump in as well yeah that sort of arranging a marriage or arranging romance and and uh talking it through yes that's been shown in a number of rom-coms and it works pretty well i mean it, it's sort of a it's a device that we don't see a lot but a, as such it, it works you know works reasonably well I, I i i thought it was well written and performed oh you get what you expect here peter don't you it's this sort of same wheelhouse as my big fat greek wedding and Mamma mia and I also reference a really good movie, The Big Sick, that, that sort of cross-cultural love affair between a Pakistani and an American. Did this do it for you or not? 
I was surprised. It actually worked very well for me uh, because I'm I, I'm sort of immune from most of the uh, rom coms, which are just so predictable and uh, go through the same story arcs. But Jemima's script, based on her own experiences of a cross cultural marriage with uh, Imran Khan and uh, that Pakistani British sort of uh, connection, etc., I found very sturdy. And in fact, there are three elements to the film that. Uh, is explored by the writing, which I was actually quite impressed by um, to, uh, uh, I suppose, make this less of a, a, a standard rom-com and more of one that has some real issues that it was trying to grapple with. One is the idea, of course, of Lily James being single and whether Emma Thompson as her mother uh, is trying to push her into being married. Is that important for a woman to be married? Secondly, the assisted marriage uh, situation and whether that's uh, a better way way of having uh, of having a relationship than um, uh, one where you find your own sort of partner and and the whole notion of cross-cultural relationships um, and how that can work um, with different religions different perspectives and so on uh, look I, I found it very sturdy and and Lily James playing the filmmaker I thought how interesting that was to interpolate that uh, her career into the whole notion of her exploring her life and of the life of of uh, the Pakistani man. So, man. So, uh, I actually quite like the film, uh, and it's also interesting to note the title uh, was used in 1993, of course, for the Tina Turner biopic yeah. that, that starred Angela Bassett. So, it's used here in a, a, a very much more interesting sort of way. I thought. Mm. Well, I mean, I thought again. You've got a couple of scene stealers. It, in a movie that is really extremely colourful, the wedding scenes are terrific. Uh, you, you've got you know, the wedding scenes in Pakistan, cavalcade of colour and finery. Obviously, Emma Thompson splashes out. She really immerses herself into that sort of larger-than-life persona with want and abandon, and she's sort of loud and hardly tactful as Zoe's mum, who does want her daughter to find Mr Right, so that I don't suppose it's different to any other parent. But she, she's, she really is given many choice lines and doesn't waste any of them. But, Greg, the other one that really stood out to me, the poker-faced Pakiza Baig, who's cast as Zahid's tell-it-like-it-is grandmother, Nanny Jan. I, I mean, what a hoot. Whenever she's captured on film, this sort of deadpan expression, what a contrast to the role that I've just mentioned before for Emma Thompson. Uh, and I also liked the um, Mo the Matchmaker um, in his small cameo there. I thought he was quite droll and funny as well. But I agree that this is sort of a cross-cultural romantic comedy. Um, it's from working title who make all these kind of romantic comedies like Love Actually and the Bridget Jones' series. And so it taps into that sort of audience straight away. I like the, um, all the cultural references there. You've got a bit of a flavour for Pakistan there. I thought those Pakistan sequences were full of colour. There's some fabulous costumes there. Um, nice production design and a couple of superbly choreographed Bollywood-style dance sequences. And I thought this gave us a vibrant sense of place and culture there. And I thought Nitin Shahini's score at, further added to the flavour of the film. Um, and I thought Lily James brought warmth and also a vulnerability and a hint of insecurity to her performance as Zoe, who's actually a likeable protagonist here. Um, let's see if exuded... Charm. And I thought the two had a wonderful, easygoing chemistry and their relationship seemed unforced and very natural there. I like Emma Thompson in a role that seems tailor-made for her. As you said, she sort of enjoyed herself here and um, cut loose a few times there. Um, and I did like um, the couple who played um, Jim's devoted parents, Shabana Asmi and Jeff Mizra. I thought they brought a sort of dignity to the, the role as well. Um I thought it was um, a good time at the cinema, but a little bit formulaic. I knew where these were headed from the word go, um, and even though I enjoyed it while I was on the screen, I found it fairly easy to forget once I walked out of the cinema. I mean, this is really feel-good entertainment. It, it should, I, I reckon it will attract an appreciative audience, and, yes, you're right, of course, th th there's no doubt about where it'll end up, but you're, Lily James, really charming, Shazad Latif, epitome of dignified, and you've mentioned the parents. Yeah, I mean, they're clearly proud of their son, they remain keen to make they they remain keen to maintain a tradition and and there, there's nothing wrong with that is there Jackie? Oh look, I'm not a person who 
enjoys rom-coms particularly. I think you even remember that, Alex. Oh, there, yeah, you yeah, know, I find them very narrow band, Jackie. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. You don't, like you don't even appreciate the mighty about, fighting yesterday yeah. football machine. You should be. I mean, in fact, I've got to deviate at this point. Um, no, Jack- no, please don't, because I would like to say. Yes. That what's love got to do with it? I've barely heard a bad word against it in what I've read and heard about it, and I'm totally there with this film. I thought it was really delightful. I'll agree with everything Peter said, and I'll agree with everything Greg said because I thought it was just lovely. It had a light touch, but it was it was um there was not really a dull moment through it, and visually as well as the language, Jemima Khan's done a great job with the dialogue. It was entertaining. It was honest. I thought it was. It was actually a rom-com that was believable um, and yet not, um, you know, uh, it it had its variations through it, except for maybe the bride wasn't quite, you know, her her double life. Yeah, it was. I didn't really agree with you to see that. Yeah, it was quite a a sharp contrast, wasn't it? apart, Apart from that, I felt there was nothing forced about it. I could see it. Quite natural, quite you know, good chemistry. Emma Thompson, as Greg just said, yes, but she Emma Thompson could have stolen the show in this, but she didn't. She just held back enough to make you know to take her role and let us enjoy all of those wonderful secondary characters. So it wasn't just all about this one romance and its ups and downs, as the normal rom com theme goes. This was about you know enjoying the uh, you know the color and 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 uh, of of the other characters and the and the Pakistani culture I thought was beautiful what I thought was lovely about having them as next door neighbors was we saw more of the mother played by Emma Thompson um uh, integrating with their culture rather than the Pakistani family uh, becoming you know sort of british in their yeah. way and I thought that was really lovely mm, well I mean there's no doubt there's a playful quality about this and and you know while not eschewing pathos there's both of those things I mean it's really great to see Jackie that you you know can soften your hard stand towards rom-coms when you get something that's that's uh, well you you would class as being a, a, a higher quality that that's that's admirable of you now you just have to embrace the mighty fighting Essen and footy machine and Dave I'm going to tell you a story about Jacqueline she during the week she texted me a, a piece of memorabilia did you not Jackie no no denial knowledge yeah denial knowledge <laughs> which was a ticket to a match between Melbourne and Essendon, I think dating back to around about 2014, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, a cherished piece of her memorabilia. So I think she's warming to football, Dave. Isn't that great to see? You know, I think we'll be having more footy talk on this program. Interesting. Mm, Exactly. Uh, it, It happened to be something I told her to destroy because it was a match that was memorably forgettable. But nevertheless, talk to me about what's love got to do with it. Did you enjoy it? Um, yeah, look, this was an interesting film for me because about a week before I went to see the film, I saw a trailer for this film before another film that went for two and a half minutes. Um, I couldn't believe it. I've never seen a trailer go for that long before, but it basically summed up the film in a short film format. Um, so I went into this film thinking... There's no way I'm going to enjoy this film. I know where it ends up. I know who ends up with who kind of thing because it was all shown in the trailer. But what I did find was that it was an enjoyable journey to get to that ending. So even though I went in knowing what was going to happen, it was enjoyable getting there. The interesting thing is I actually interviewed the director um, of this film, Shakar Kapoor, and um, he said to me that he doesn't see this as a film about assisted marriage. He meant for this to be a film about love and the different ways that people get there. And I almost felt during the interview that he kind of gets offended when people say that this is a film about arranged marriage, because for him, as he said, it's a love letter about love. It's not a love letter about arranged marriage or showing arranged marriage to, to the outside world or anything like that. So it's difficult though, Dave, because I mean, ultimately for most people, and, and I think you can use the word most, uh, it, it's not something that we are familiar with in this country. I, I mean, right. maybe the Jewish community, absolutely. Um, I get that, that, that the, quite a number of the, the Jewish community is aware of it. But the broader community, it's not something that's commonplace. Obviously, if you, you're born in a particular part of the world and you move here and so forth. So, uh, I mean, I understand what, what the director's saying, 
but you know, it, it's it's also to me the figures that I cited at the start of this conversation are quite noteworthy because six percent of arranged unions end in divorce apparently in the UK. That's incredibly low because we know the divorce rate in the Western world is very very high. So you know, even though it might not be something that uh, off the bat you and I would favour, uh, it clearly has still has a place even in 2023. Yeah, yeah, and he said that. That was one of the things that he actually said. It still exists, and that's why um, for him and Jemima it was in this film because this is supposed to be a film that shows the different way that people get to love. So, yeah, it was just interesting that that was his strong point during the interview was please don't call this a film about arranged marriage. It's a film about love. But like I said, I found it an enjoyable journey watching the film. Um I'm not always a big fan of rom-coms either, but this one had me laughing at different times. Um, so, yeah, I really, really did enjoy it. Um, I wouldn't say it's film of the year, but it wasn't an endurement, as I call some rom-coms. Mm, all right, Jackie, score out of 10 from you, please. Ah, indeed. I think she's disappeared. Having having said that, let's get a score out of 10 from you, Dave. Uh, six out of 10 from me. Wow. Okay. It's it's surprisingly low, uh, but there we go. All right, Greg. Six to six and a half for me. Mm-hmm. Peter, I think you'll go higher. Yeah, it was a very sturdy script and a good storyline, the three aspects, so I gave it seven out of ten. And I gave it seven and a half out of ten. So there we go. Now, on Jay Air, we, we must talk about a movie called Knock at the Cabin, which – I mean, it's uh, it's got a really interesting concept behind it. It's M-rated, it's 100 minutes, and it concerns a bright young girl uh, whose name is Wen, W-E-N, played by Kristen Kiwi. She's nearly eight years of age, and she's collecting grasshoppers and putting them into a large jar so she can study them. There are holes at the top so they can breathe, so rest assured. There's, there's not about nothing about endangerment here. Anyway, she's she's a special kid because she was adopted by her two dads, one of them being Andrew, Ben Aldridge, and the other being Eric, Jonathan Groff, when she was just a baby. And now they've all travelled to a remote log cabin in the Pennsylvania woods for a holiday. And it's there that Wen is confronted by what can only be described as a giant of a man. His name's Leonard, played by Dave Batista who says that he wants to be her friend because stranger danger immediately comes to her mind. But in no time, he's telling her that his heart is broken because of what he must do, which he claims is the most important job in world history. And that amounts to holding Wen and her parents hostage and prevailing upon them to make an unthinkable choice to avoid Armageddon. Lender, though, he's not, not alone. He's joined by three others. One, being an angry gas worker, Redman, played by Rupert Grint, the cook, Adrian, played by Abby Quinn, and a nurse, Sabrina, Nikki Amuka Bird. And with them are handcrafted weapons. So every time that the two fathers, Andrew and Eric, say no to what the what is being asked of them, the collective maintains that a calamity will befall the earth. And to prove it, when the couple does so the first time, when they say no, the armed strangers turn on the television to the news that an earthquake and resultant tsunami have wreaked devastation. And the consequences of all of this grow exponentially for each subsequent rejection. And all the while, the interlopers maintain they were compelled to do what they're doing in a bid to save the planet. So the screenplay by the director M. Night Shyamalan, Steve Desmond and Michael Sherman is based on a book by Paul Tremblay called The Cabin at the End of the World. It, it starts off at the very outset. You've got this chilling music over the opening credits, credits which is a portent of, of what's to come. So this is a home invasion movie with a decided difference. And, and for quite some time, we, the audience, can only guess at just what is going to go down here. All we know is that it's mysterious, it's scary, it is quite an intriguing psychological thriller, Greg. Uh, yeah, it's probably one of M. Night Shyamalan's better films for quite some time. I mean, Old left me a bit cold and disappointed with its ending there, and After Earth is probably 
the year of his career. But this one's a very claustrophobic thriller, I thought, there. Most of the action is confined to the interior of this cabin, and the use of close-ups and that from the camera men also adds to that um, tension there. And I like the fact that the two um, leads are actually played by gay actors, and it's a positive depiction of a gay couple here, I thought, which worked really well. Um, their relationship is fleshed out by a couple of um, flashback sequences there. But this is not your typical home invasion thriller, but it's suffused with a dark and creepy edge, as you said. Um, it also plays to the fears we have coming out of two years of lockdown and pandemic there and the prevalent belief in a lot of conspiracy theories um, about the end of the world there. Um, but it's also given over to some of Shyamalan's usual weird and unsettling touches there as well. As a lean, mean production, I thought it worked quite well there. The tension is rammed up a bit. The violence is downplayed a little bit. The camera often cuts away just before a bit of blood is spilled there. And I actually like Dave Batista here. He has an impressive, usually brawny physical presence here. But here I think Shyamalan teases a more layered, compassionate, um, nuanced performance from him allowing him to demonstrate a broader range than usual. Um, he's friendly and charming on the surface, but there's also an edgy, menacing, messianic quality to him there as well. I thought the Ben Aldrich and Jonathan Groff are great in their roles, conveying a lot of the, the fear um, they have there. I thought Curie, though, was the weakest link in the cast with a shrill and grating performance. The film's nicely shot, I thought, um, and I thought the screenplay sort of tapped into... Um, a lot of what's going on in the world nowadays with the paranoia, conspiracy theories and sort of end-of-the-world um, fears. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I thought it was quite well done. I, I, I disagree with you about Kristen Kiwi. I, I think thought she did a fine job as this uh, wide-eyed, innocent. I mean, she was combining vulnerability with resilience and strengths, and, and I, I thought she did a really fine job. Uh, uh, what did you think of it, Dave, uh, new, the newcomer, Kristen Kiwi? Yeah, no, I thought she was really good in this. And, and like, this is her first ever film as well. Mm -hmm. So and it would have been a really, really tense set um, shooting this film because it's such a claustrophobic um, film. I was surprised how good this film was because I will admit I'm a Shyamalan fan, but even I will admit that he's made some rubbish over the years as well. But when he's at his peak, he is a great director. And... Um, but you never know what you're going to get with him. You can go in and, and get a, a, a four or five star film. You can go in and get a one or two star film. So I was pleasantly surprised by this film. I loved that opening sequence where it was um, where it was just when out in the woods doing a childlike thing and all of a sudden you have this man monster in Leonard um, coming up to her. I thought that scene was really, really good. And I think one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years is Dave Bautista's not like The Rock or John Cena. He comes from that wrestling background, but you can actually give him a character to work with um, and he'll do it. And it's interesting, I was reading the other day that apparently he's um, going to be doing a play um, in New York very, very soon. So he's really coming into his own as an actor now as well. And he can carry a film like this and, and do such a remarkable job. He's not just a a presence like the rock is um in a film thing i just googled him uh, you know uh, like I, I look at him and i think oh my golly man mountain and <laughs> this this is a guy who's sort of getting onto two meters in height 1.93 meters he weighs 131 kilos now yeah. that that's that's much more than double me dave so yeah <laughs> I, I i understand why you look at him here and i you know, I, I agree with uh, Greg's point here. I looked at him and I was really impressed by what he's deliberately softened this sort of tough guy persona. He realises Leonard is a man driven by circumstances to pursue the path that he's on. And I thought it was a really important, uh, I mean, a pivotal role in the movie. And I thought he handled it particularly well. And it shows that he's not just a one trick pony, which I think is really important. Yeah, well, the film that made me realise that there was more to him than just the the wrestling action man was actually a family film he made a few years ago called My Spy, where um, he, again, played this role where he had to be tough because he was a spy, but he was around a child for a majority of the film hmm. and protecting her. And it was like, well, he even put in a performance that you wouldn't expect an actor to put into a family film. I mean, we've seen... Vin Diesel do one of those films before. We've seen Bruce Willis do them. And 
uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and their acting has been terrible in those films. Mm-hmm. But for him, it was like, this is an opportunity where I'm not playing Drax the superhero, um, and he embraced it. And I, I read an article recently where um, a director in Hollywood was saying that Batista is the best wrestler-turned-actor that we've ever seen, and oh. I'm slowly coming around to that belief. Good stuff. Uh, did you also enjoy it, Peter? No. Uh, uh, sh- sh- we just missed sh- you quickly. Uh, there's a knock sh- at the cabin door. Can I please talk? Sh- I, I, you can talk in a moment. I was just going to say there's a knock at the cabin door. You might want to answer it. Sorry, I, you didn't even allow, allow me my, my, my moment of humour. There you go. Go for it, Peter. Well, I think even the title is wrong. It, it should be the original book's title. Look, what Shia Marlin has done here is uh, painted himself into a corner. He's trying desperately to develop stories that um, have twists in them, have something uh, weird and wonderful in them, uh, whatever, to set him apart from other filmmakers. I think in this one he has failed to some extent. The problem with this film is it's sort of a remake of Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and none of it is believable in this film. Film. I mean, this idea of being entreated by whom to talk about the end of the world, to have a gay couple, which I think is actually a, a terrible choice because it, there is some, some subtext here about why a gay couple, we have flashbacks about them being bullied and all that sort of thing. I thought, ah, there's something really off about this film. And and, and this whole notion of planes dropping from the sky and, and the world is going to collapse if they don't say yes to uh, killing one of them. And, and, and the child that is put in so much danger. And I really felt that uh, uh, there was a bit of child abuse happening on the set here as well, because she's in the midst of all this terrible, uh, these terrible language and violence and events. Look, uh, there's a lot to uh, dislike about this film. I was not impressed. I would have liked a much better storyline and explanation for it all. So no, uh, knock knock at the uh, uh, cabin doesn't work for me at all. What are you giving out of 10? Okay, I, uh, I barely give it, barely give it five out of ten. Wow. Okay, Greg, I'd give it six to six and a half. I, I thought, I thought it had a lot of um, good things about it. I yeah, fair enough. Seat. And what about you, Dave? I'm giving it a seven. I, I really liked it. Yeah, and I really liked it too. I give it seven and a half. So there you go, three to one. But you, you're perfectly entitled to your opinion uh, on this, and I understand why you have it, Peter. Um, even if you're wrong, uh, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. No, but and I mean, that's I, understand, opinion. <laughs> I understand. Yes, exactly. I understand why. I understand why you feel the way you do. I just don't happen to share it. I just want to uh, because we haven't got a lot of time. Mary Poppins, Her Majesty's Theatre. In a word, it is, and I'm, I know this is twee. It is supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It is the staging, the set design, the magic introduced into this Disney and Cameron Macintosh production are absolutely sublime. Everything from the doll's house that opens up to the Banks family home to the appearance of Poppins' iconic large-scale brolly towards the end of the show, you just have to see it to appreciate how special those things are. And that's just merely brushing the surface. With everyone's favourite nanny, uh, you know, what she's able to do to pull from her colourful bag of tricks, both literally and metaphorically, quite mesmerising and, you know, it starts with a full-size hat stand. I'm not going to go any further than that, but there's a lot more sleight of hand here. Brass bed opening and closing without anybody touching it, cup floating in midair, mop doing its business without human contact, mayhem in the kitchen, brilliance in costuming as well, helps one believe that statues can actually come to life, and all these great show-stopping numbers choreographed to perfection and there's all this great adulation, hand clapping and wolf whistling and whatever from an appreciative audience. And, and I hope that even Fred Astaire would have been as impressed as I was when this, what's the collective noun for, for chimney sweeps? I, I have no idea. But when all of these chimney sweeps come out, they take to the stage in a tap dancing extravaganza. It really is something special. And the original music and lyrics, Richard M and Robert B. Sherman, they're divine. You know, songs like Spoonful of Sugar, Let's Go Fly a Kite, Chim Chim Cheree. This, of course, is that P.L. Travers' timeless tale mixed with the 1964 Disney movie about the residents of 17 Cherry Tree Lane, and and it really does excite anew. It is terrific. The performances are just great. And Stephanie Jones, flawless as Mary Poppins, beautiful voice, no-nonsense approach, warm and engaging throughout, loved her interaction with the household and the kids, but also with the incomparable Marina Pryor, who fills two pivotal roles 
including the bird lady, the bird woman selling seeds at Tuppence, a bag, and uh, George Banks' former cruel demanding nanny Miss Andrew. Really, really good. But so many good performances. Jack Chambers, charming, particularly agile, light on his feet as an artist, and a chimney sweep, the, the Bert character, open in his affections for Mary. And the kids are great. And Tom Wren sort of channeling stiffness and distance as George Banks. And then you've got Lucy Maunder. What a great performer she is. Golden Pipes, Little in a Step as the long-suffering wife Winifred. Dab Hand in this production. So many more. It is a magnificent, polished, cross-generational show. Please, folks, go along and see it. There's nothing. It's, it, it just blew my mind. It was wonderful. Do not miss out on getting your spoonful of sugar at Her Majesty's Theatre until, at this stage, tickets till the 30th of April. We have reached the end of another show, folks. Be good to one another. Be good to one another. I'm tripping over my words in finishing. And we'll catch you next time on First on Film and Entertainment. <laughs>